Libertarianism is pro-immigration, pro-market, pro-trade. More competitive, less centralized. Not military confrontations, but peaceful interaction. The war on drugs has been actually an unmitigated disaster. How in the 19th century the reforms eliminated the belief system, the, the different religious, uh, I guess, the different levels of religion. Mm -hmm. But of course, the Ottomans did not experience that. At the same time that under European pressure they adopted those reforms, it was also the time of the expansion of the capitulation agreements, mm -hmm. which treated the Ottomans as secondary citizens. So can't be other when be another element in here, the historical element, that what we talk about of human rights, equality, all of that, was experienced in a very different way by the non-Western society that were colonized by the West and by Europe. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, as a political scientist, I don't put that much emphasis on religion. I see the problem that both yeah, scientists do that. Ran into in, in Malaysia as a problem of the national state, <coughs> not necessarily a religious thing. It also happens in secular states. Turkey being mm -hmm. the great example of it happened under Ataturk secularism, and it's happening under semi-religious of the present regime. Mm -hmm. So it's a problem of secularism and nationalism, not necessarily a problem of religion. Mm -hmm. So I just was wondering if I can get your reaction to that. Thank you so much, first of all, for the great Turkish. And that was <laughs> impressive. And uh, thank you so much for the very good points you made. And I can say a few things on top of that. Uh, the very first point was, sorry, it was about... Uh, the reforms and better reformation. Is Here's the thing. Oh, is Islam already being reformed for 14 centuries? Islam is being reinterpreted since the beginning. Uh, what we are in right now is a specific era. It's, it's the crisis with modernity. I mean, Islam had its own pace. Uh, it was reinterpreted. There was an idea of ijtihad. Things were changing slowly here and there. It was <coughs> adapting. It was evolving. But then came something from the West called modernity. And that came with colonialization. That came with the conquests of Egypt by Napoleon. That came with the uh, onslaught on the Ottomans. That came with a lot of things, bad things and good things. And that came with criticism. That came with rationalism, with liberalism and human rights. And sometimes these were, uh, there were good things and bad things. And for example, I mean, the Ottomans, they were, were they forced by the Western powers to accept non-Muslims as equal citizens? Yes. They did this partly for, to, you know, to be in good terms with the British, which they were then allies. Similarly, the Ottomans banned slave trade thanks to British pressures. Now, should I say, you know, I'm an anti imperialist, so Ottomans should not have bone. I mean, no, banning slave trade was a good thing. But I would still be pissed at the British because they came and occupied Istanbul, my city. So modernity is a complicated thing. And in, in non-Western societies, modernity came as sometimes colonialism, sometimes occupation, and sometimes there's some norms. And sometimes those norms were used hippocratically to advance some agendas too. I admit that as well. But I still think the norms are interesting and important. Like British colonialism. I mean, the, the British went to India and they banned sati. What is sati? It's a Hindu tradition. When the husbands died, they would burn the husband's body, right? And they would put the woman, the alive woman, into the fire too, because she's not good anymore. Her husband is gone, what are you living here for? So that was a tradition, you know, in Hinduism. And the, it was the British first banned that. Banned that. Uh, it's still, maybe not happening, but until a few decades ago, it was still happening in India. It was legal, but in some rural areas. So this this big package called modernity came, and I think it had goods and bad sides, and, and always there's always a difficulty in borrowing ideas from other civilizations, especially if they're more powerful and they're a little bit arrogant, or uh, they're, you know, not very, you know, respectful to difference and all that. I see that problem, but that is, we have to sort this out. We have to uh, figure out what is human rights, and, and we should not forget that the Western colonialism was criticized within the West itself, thanks to those certain norms. So it's a complicated thing. Uh, uh, the crisis with modernity, Arnold Toynbee gave a great uh, example of Islam, and I've written about this uh, in my Jesus book and a few columns as well. 
he, Arnold Toynbee, the great British historian, he likened the modern crisis of Islam, or the Islamic civilization in the modern era, its crisis, to the crisis of Jews at the time of Jesus, vis-a-vis -vis Rome. Jews were God's chosen people, but there was a Roman hegemony on them, which came as political power and also Hellenism and culture and everything. And against that, Jews have given different responses. And he speaks about the Herodians and the Zealots. And Herodians are the people who wanted to imitate their Roman ways, and the Zealots were the ones who were fighting against it. And he thinks, you know, there's some analogy there. And I think let's let's take the Jesus way, you know, the kind of reformist, but within the tradition and so on and so forth. Uh, so that is what I can say. Regarding Turkey, is politics more decisive on, it, like, was my arrest in Malaysia because of politics? Or Politics explains a lot. And actually, I do think the very course of Islam is explained by politics in many ways. I mean, the whole Sunni Shia divide is a totally political matter. Uh, I mean, what is the big disagreement? Whether Ali or Abu Bakr was the right answer. It's a totally political issue. I mean, so politics has been very definitive on every society, including Islam from the very beginning, especially Islam. But I do think theology, jurisprudence, has a life of its own. If it is written in religious books and fatwas that this is the case, that shapes the mind of the society. That shapes the mind. That shapes the mind of a politician. The politician might be using it for you know, populism and all that, but it is still there. Therefore, I think religious revival of religious sciences or rethinking Islam is, I think, important. And it is a part of a discussion. At least that is something I'm interested in. I'm not saying the political side of the things are not, or they're not definitive. Speaking of Turkey, you are very right. And uh, Turkey shows us that authoritarianism is a reality that can flourish under religion or flourish under secularism, too. I mean, Turkey has always been authoritarian in my lifetime. It was authoritarian with secular references. Now it's authoritarian with religious references. And th there's always a blasphemy law, but it's not about insulting God or prophet. It's about insulting the president. Yeah. And it, it can put a lot of people in jail. So yes, I mean, the problems in Muslim majority societies are not always related to religion. I would say that. Uh, Turkey's biggest problem is probably nationalism more than anything else. That's why we can't get, all, get our act together with our Kurdish minority all the time. So, I agree with you that religion is not the only lens we should look through, but it is a very important lens too. And changing of the religious mind, I think, is an important project. Like a thing. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Sure. So do you think it's important to take the example of Turkey? Can't be just say that the summit is not between modernity and tradition, but between more, multiple versions of modernity. Like to go on arguments, right? Yeah, that's right. But the thing is, those, I mean, modernities, different modernities, I mean, I've written about that, you know, 10 years ago, and I was more excited about that, too. Okay, there's still that. But what I'm interested in is, is liberal modernity. China is modern today. I don't want China model anywhere. I mean, they, might not, they make cheap, nice products, but... Uh, they jail you for criticizing the regime. So the question is, can we have liberalism? And I think modernity, modernity is just a state. It's about technology. It's about uh, public space. Uh, Soviet Union was modern. Nazis were super modern. Uh, they were more advanced than Weimar Germany or the pre, you know, not Germany. Uh, I think that there, modernity has bad and good fruits and products, and liberalism, or liberal democracy, is I think the better example, the better fruit of modernity. <coughs> so, is that a universal idea? Can we have liberal democracy around the world? People will say no for different reasons. Some people in the West will say, no, it's only us Westerners who can handle this. You know, others are kind of not really good for it. I don't think they would say that anymore. Well, yeah, they say that. <laughs> well, they're building a wall for a certain reason. They think that people from other civilizations are not, uh, you know, fit for a certain culture, and they will not be. They will be detrimental to the culture and so on and so forth. And uh, we are at the age of nationalism right now in all, all corners of the world. But I do still believe in a notion of universal human rights. 
uh, and I think we should try to advance that. I think it was it was an accident of history, maybe it happened that in the West, but I think it's it's a precious thing. That's why we're speaking to us today, without thinking the religious police will be out there. And I, I'll tell you, that's a blessing. You don't have that in every country in the world. Yes, sir. Thank you. That was very enlightening. I read your book a few years ago. Uh, so I find this contradictory claim. There's always this claim that uh, the silent majority in Islamic world are moderates. Right? Uh, you started you thought in a similar fashion, right? Don't 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 create some hasty generalization from a few instances of bad actors. So I always wondered who, who's your intended audience of your book? Was it the extremists that you're hoping will adopt some kind of reformist al type of legal methodology or interpreting the Quran in light of new values? Or is it the majority is already moderate? And so is it just to give them better arguments to articulate why the beliefs are more consistent with what's the democratic values of human rights? Or is it to try to persuade those who are on the fringe? Uh, I've always wondered who's your intent. I mean, it sells well. So yeah. There's an audience Thank buying you. and reading, including myself. Sure. But I was wondering what's, what's supposed to be convincing to someone who's not of that Thank you. Very good point. Very good question. Uh, first of all, I don't think that we can classify the Muslim world into radicals and moderates. That's too simple of a classification. Uh, any classification will be very simple. But to make it a little bit more, slightly more nuanced, we should think of radicals or fundamentalists, or these people would be either the violent jihadists, terrorists, or Islamists who are prone to that kind of ideology. These people are, let's say, the radicals. And there are illiberal moderates, which is the majority. There's a term created by a, an American social scientist that he says Muslim world is not divided between radicals and moderates. There are radicals, illiberal moderates, and there's a small liberal minority. What, what do I mean by illiberal moderates? These are the majorities in Egypt or Pakistan. Well, if you ask, should blasphemers go to jail? probably executed, they will say, yes, of course. Uh, they're not going to do it. They're not going to bomb a place for it. But they certainly have values and norms that are illiberal from a liberal perspective. I mean, the Pew Research Center had a great values research in 2003. It shows that and people are asked, that should adulterers be stoned, do you think? And majorities in Egypt, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia say yes. Uh, when you come to Turkey, like 8% say yes. When you go to Bosnia, it's 1%, or Albania, 0.2% or something. So there's diversity. But those people certainly think that religion somehow should be imposed. The values of religion should be imposed through the legal system. They don't believe in a <coughs> free society as free society would be defined in, in the West, let's say. Uh, so my audience is those people. I'm not going to convince El Shabaab, and they'll probably kill me if they find me, or people like or kill, they'll kill all of us if they were here. But. So I mean, that's a kind of fringe. I mean, that's a that's difficult. But I want to convince illiberal moderates uh, to show that well, we can rethink these issues. Uh, one thing I when I say to Muslim audiences is like I I said this a lot in Malaysia like. Do we Muslims ever appreciate liberalism? I said, yes, we love it when we are in France and we want to wear a headscarf. Against the French secularists, we say, we want freedom, right? The woman should be able to wear whatever she wants. It's her individual choice. That's a great thing, and we need it against. In Turkey, this was the argument used by religious conservatives against the secularists who were banning the headscarf in Europe. And I said, this is a great thing. This is great happening here. Now they all forgot it because now they have power. But and that's I'm saying, well, let's get an idea from there. If it is about individual choice, let's bring that individual choice to France. Let's bring that individual choice to you know Muslim majority societies. So my audience is those. My audience is even the liberals, that small group, who are persuaded by liberal ideas, but don't have too much ammunition to defend it, to advance it. So when I write, I mean, the, the feedback I get from is like the liberals in Malaysia said, yes, this article will help us a lot. We'll now translate it into Malay and we'll publish it there. <coughs> the tougher guys in Malaysia will see that 